Okay. Just to, uh, just to again reiterate what I um, wanted, what I said in the beginning, and I think what came out quite clearly, this is looking at approaches to hereditary cancer syndrome. Lynch syndrome is a case study here, but we do want this to be broader, and I think that was nicely brought up about different family histories and um, how people may present and why we need to think in broader terms here. Um, Juan Rodriguez will be our next moderator. He was a great um, panelist on our steering committee. He's a program director for the CDC Public Health Cancer Genomics Program and is an epidemiologist with the um, Division of Cancer Prevention and Control at the CDC. Um, and his research um, fact centers on access to care and health disparities, um, which is another cross-cutting theme we have here. So Juan, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to um, introduce all our speakers for this particular session um, and just give very brief introductions. We have extremely qualified and what appears to be extremely busy <laughs> um, people just based on their on their short bios alone. Um, so first up, we have Dr. Nancy Baxter, who will be speaking about um, some international experiences with implementation of Lynch syndrome screening. Um, and she is the head of the Division of General Surgery at St. Michael's Hospital. And she's also a scientist with the Lee Ka Shing Knowledge Institute and a senior scientist at the Institute uh, for Clinical Evaluation Science. She's also the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at the Dalalana School of Public Health and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Next, um, Dr. Nora Lane Linder and Dr. Mark Jenkins are going to be speaking about the Colon Cancer Family Registry Project. Um, Dr. Linder is a medical geneticist at the Mayo Clinic, and her research is focused on understanding the risk and management for those with hereditary familial cancer predisposition. Um, and she's a principal investigator in the Colon Cancer Family Registry. And Dr. Jenkins is a director and professor at the Center for Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Melbourne. And he's also a chief investigator um, of the Center for Research Excellence reducing the burden of colorectal cancer by optimizing screening. Um, Deb Duquette will be speaking about the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network. She is a ge the genomics coordinator at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and she serves as a project manager and director on multiple CDC cooperative agreements to promote public health cancer genomics best, pra best practices. Heather Hampel will be speaking about um, the Ohio uh, CRC Universal Screening Program for Lynch Syndrome. Um, she is a licensed genetic counselor and clinical professor in the Division of Human Genetics at the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, and starting off our discussion, um, period will be Dr. Jessica Hunter, who's an assistant investigator at Kaiser Permanente's Northwest Center for Health Research. Um, so I'll turn to our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. And just to get a little bit of a perspective um, on the audience, uh, how many of you here came, come mainly from a uh, genetic testing, genetic counseling, um, uh, cancer family perspective? And how many come primarily from a population-based screening, so colorectal cancer screening perspective? Okay, uh, so I'm from the colorectal cancer uh, uh, screening perspective primarily, uh, and so um, take my comments uh, in that light. I'm not a geneticist, I'm not a genetic counselor, and that is not my area of expertise. Um, but I am an expert in uh, colorectal cancer screening. And this is how I came to this area, um, because uh, I'm uh, uh, a part of Cancer Care Ontario. I'm actually their endoscopy lead, so I'm responsible for administering endoscopy to the entire province. Uh, and we recently instituted a high-risk uh, breast cancer screening program, uh, and we're now focusing on potentially implementing a high-risk colorectal cancer screening program. And obviously, screening for Lynch uh, cancer syndrome is one of the important pillars of this. So just to briefly talk about uh, what I'm facing and what I'm up against in terms of trying to develop uh, this type of program with the other people at Cancer Care Ontario and the, and the providers and patients in Ontario. Ontario has 14 million people and uh, a huge geographic area, uh, 400, about 450,000 square miles. So uh, a, um, a very big area with some expert centers, but many um, centers uh, that are community-based uh, and fairly small. 
Um, there's no real system of care delivery. Uh, the care is delivered at individual institutions. Uh, there are overseers, uh, there are payers, um, but there's no real system of delivery. So each hospital and each clinician uh, largely works on their own. Um, uh, and the incidence of colorectal cancer in Ontario is amongst the highest in the world. Um, so clearly this is a problem uh, that we would like to address uh, in a, um, uh, a, a uniform way. Um, but I, I really took uh, Andy's comments to heart about um, survivors talking about how if they were at a uh, NCI designated center, they had access to genetic counseling, genetic testing and knowledge, uh, and if they were uh, at other centers, potentially they didn't have quite the same access. Uh, and obviously when we're designing a system for, uh, for a province, for Ontario, uh, some of the key, um, key things that we need to keep in mind are equity and access. So these are very important principles uh, in terms of designing a program, and easily um, uh, programs can be designed that, uh, that have uh, inequitable access to these types of testing, and that's a problem. Well, we've heard that reflex testing for Lynch syndrome is becoming the recommended standard of care. I've also heard that uh, this, is, uh, this is yesterday's news. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Lynch, I definitely hear you um, that things are moving forward. But um, the whole thing about population-based testing and screening, and from that I mean a colorectal population-based screening, um, it's, it's less nimble than when we're uh, at the patient's bedside. Uh, and also, uh, is the implementation uh, is imperfect. Uh, and so it may be yesterday's news, but uh, yesterday's news wasn't read yesterday. So uh, I think when we're talking about implementing a population-based program, uh, we have to look at what's possible uh, and, and implementing it in an equitable way. So having said that, uh, reflex testing is becoming standard of care, and we have increasing numbers of jurisdictions that are doing this and doing this well. So there's a real opportunity to learn from, um, from places that have gone through the growing pains of introducing um, uh, population-based testing. Uh, and so in terms of uh, my approach and our approach in Ontario, uh, we uh, wanted to learn from, um, from uh, places that were doing it well. Ontario currently has an ad hoc approach, uh, so this is based on, um, you know, the typical NCI cancer center type places uh, who have interests in, um, in Lynch cancer family syndrome and other uh, cancer syndromes uh, in terms of applying um, what would be considered standard of care for their patients for uh, detection of high-risk uh, uh, patients, uh, and uh, also for oncologists who are trying to look at uh, MSI and uh, um, uh, mismatch repair defects uh, in terms of determining treatment. So for the, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about reflex testing versus universal screening. And I'm doing this because um, I come from things as a population-based colon cancer screener, which has a very different meaning than universal screening in this context. So I'm talking about reflex testing in terms of reflex testing of tumors to differentiate it from population-based colorectal cancer screening. Um, so, why reflex testing? We've heard about, uh, uh, about reflex testing, perhaps some of the limitations of this. Um, but we know that the current system relies on assessment of family history. It's a, a blunt tool uh, and an imperfect tool, but it is a tool nonetheless. Uh, and a pathologic in, uh, evaluation and risk stratification by individual clinicians. So there's a lot of reliance on knowledge uh, and the individual uh, follow through of, uh, of clinicians treating patients, and this probably is isn't the best approach to making sure that everyone has uh, access at, at, and to, um, to appropriate follow through and appropriate testing. So there are many opportunities to fail and when we create opportunities to fail, we are going to fail. When we design a system that allows people to fall through the cracks, people will fall through the cracks. Uh, and also an ad hoc approach will not achieve our goals of prevention. So we don't have a systematic approach to identify relatives and there's a lack of a systematic approach to high risk cancer screening. So this is one of the other things that a population based um, screening program can do. Uh, it can uh, test best practices for screening of high risk individuals uh, on a population basis, which I think is what really needs to happen to move us forward. Um, so we talk about population-based reflex testing like it's uh, yesterday's news and like it's a slam dunk, but it's not a slam dunk. And why is it not a slam dunk? It's not a slam dunk because there are numerous barriers to implementation on a population-based level. There are barriers with respect to awareness, with respect to cost, capacity to do this, 
quality of how this is done and then follow through. And I'm going to talk about most of these things in context of what is currently being done elsewhere. So what we did when we tried to approach this for Ontario, and this is still in progress in Ontario, um, we decided to do a number of different steps to try to assess uh, both what was best practice, so these were environmental scans and interviews with other programs. Then we also assessed our actual capacity to be able to implement this within Ontario and what the actual barriers and facilitators would be within our own context. And then we had a stakeholder meeting to try to discuss all of these things and plan a way forward, and that's kind of uh, where we're at right now. So today what I'm going to talk about is our environmental scan and, uh, and how we tried to learn from uh, what was done elsewhere in terms of uh, the uh, experience of others and the best practices of others. So what we did was we reviewed the published and grade literature to identify some exemplars. And so there are other population-based and reflex uh, lynch cancer syndrome testing programs. This isn't meant to be comprehensive, uh, but these are exemplars. And what we chose were programs that weren't just in one hospital or a couple of hospitals, but programs that tried to either cover a population, a system, or a group of hospitals. So, um, so a variety in terms of the uh, practitioners and um, uh, programs, uh, hospitals that were involved in the program. And what we did was interviewed key informants, so program leaders, to understand the structure of the programs, what worked, what didn't work, what helped things work, what, what was a hindrance, barriers and facilitators, to get guidance for our implementation and to understand the real factors driving success. And, and I see uh, a number of the uh, key informants that uh, participated in this program. And uh, thank you very much to all of you. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, really learn from, from your uh, words of wisdom. So we identified seven programs that we interviewed. Um, there were, they, they were across the world, uh, so one in Canada, um, uh, four in the United States, and two in Australia. Um, so we looked at three population-based programs. So these were programs that were designed to cover all of the people within a geographic region um, through, uh, through a, a governmental or at least with the support of, uh, of the um, government of those jurisdictions. We also looked at uh, two health service organizations which aimed to cover all of their population within their health service organizations uh, with a, a reflex testing approach. And then we looked at two state-based organizations uh, that were uh, hospital-based but trying to reach out to all the hospitals in their states to ensure that everyone had access to reflex testing. And we did semi-structured interviews uh, by phone with uh, these uh, um, key informants, and they were representatives from, from the programs uh, um, who uh, were able to give us key information about how those programs worked. And we snowballed off of people within the program. We asked them who we should talk to within those programs and talked to them about who we should talk to at other programs as well. We used proposive and theoretical sampling technique to make sure we really understood how those programs worked uh, and had a um, thorough evaluation of that. Uh, and then analyze the data using pattern, thematic, and content analysis. Uh, so we tried to analyze and extract program features and best practices that could be applied to our program uh, and inform the development of our program. So um, this is the scope of uh, individuals that we uh, interviewed. As you can see, uh, many of them were genetic counselors, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. They are a real driver of these programs. They're the people that really make them work. We talked to program directors, researchers, as well as the practitioners that are involved with implementation, pathologists, the geneticists, uh, and then the family practitioners uh, and medical oncologists. Uh, and these are the, uh, the summary of the programs, and you have this, uh, I won't go into it in detail. There are a number of features that are common between the programs and some which differ. Um, we've talked about the administration and funding of the programs. The screening, uh, all programs had a series of tests um, that led to genetic counseling, other than one which had uh, at least some of the patients go directly to genetic counseling from uh, IHC testing. Uh, most had several layers of testing before, uh, before it prompted uh, genetic counseling. Um, uh, now, in terms of how patients were referred to genetic counselors, um, this is uh, important in that um, there was a number of uh, various steps uh, leading to referral, um, and some of which relied on clinicians to do so. And then there were different ways of contacting the patients and following them up in quality assurance. Some of the key themes uh, were that you had to involve the pathologists. 
that the pathologists were key drivers and could be key barriers to implementation. So what's really important if you're trying to do this is that you have to get the pathologists on board because if not, they will see this as a burden. The second thing is genetic, the genetic counselors are really key drivers to make sure this program works and runs and that patients don't get missed. And then there are also, uh, also important um, stakeholders, administration, there's going to be administrative burden, it needs to be acknowledged, um, surgery and primary care physicians. So you have the, uh, the testing that occurs uh, for such a program, the key things. Um, there are age cutoffs. Two of the programs had age cutoffs. There are pluses and minuses that we heard about. The plus being that this is a cheaper program um, to administer. The minuses being you have to remember who you're testing or not. And sometimes it's easier for a program like this just to say we're going to test everybody. Um, then uh, there's some variation in terms of what types of markers are used and what patterns are used. Um, and then there's a challenge of the changing landscape that we've already, uh, already heard about. Um, there's a variation in who refers patients to genetic counselors. And I must say this is very important for any program to consider because this led, we, as far as we can tell, to variation in uptake and counseling. Between these programs, there are a wide range in uptake of genetic counseling for people that are identified as Lynch cancer, likely Lynch cancer family syndrome carriers, uh, from 50% to up to not over 90%. And this depends on how patients are referred to counseling. So this is an extremely important step. Um, and finally, programmatic cancer screening of relatives was not a feature. How these relatives get followed up in a programmatic way, and that's important for Ontario. That's a key, going to be a key component of our program. And finally, quality insurance. Uh, it's often based on some type of centralized system with the genetic counselor being the main uh, gatekeeper and the key person in terms of making sure that uh, this is a quality program. Um, but likely when you're dealing with a province of uh, over 13 million people, we're going to have to have a more administrative and centralized structure. So again, failure follow-up from test to counseling represents a real risk to the program and maybe a real role for navigation, and it may be a cost-effective role. So it may be cost-effective to have navigators because if you don't adequately navigate people, then you're going to actually have identified people with Lynn syndrome and never have them brought to counseling. There needs to be built-in quality assurance in electronic records or databases to make sure people don't get missed and follow-up doesn't get missed, and that can be done also with automatic, automated systems and standardized information. So people talked about a top-down approach where you basically said this is how the program should be run uh, and uh, we should be doing um, uh, standard testing and it will be done. Um, there was a lot of talk about this being a quick way to implement uh, a program, um, but it can be seen as authoritarian, particularly to the pathologists who are the really key members of this group to implement uh, this program. Uh, the other approach to driving the program is bottom-up, uh, and that's uh, assessing your culture of practice uh, and um, using, um, using key, uh, your stakeholders and uh, uh, committed people to try and drive uh, and change your culture of practice. And it's inclusive and more likely to result in long-term adoption, but takes longer. And so our programs, the programs we interviewed talked about using both approaches. So um, having a, uh, a declaration that this will be done and implemented, but also having uh, a, um, a change management um, uh, approach, uh, trying to build uh, consensus and support um, from the ground up. Uh, lots of barriers and facilitators that were uh, identified. I've talked about many and um, happy to discuss them more in detail uh, as the discussion progresses. So uh, key considerations, we found many similarities between the programs with variation in protocols and standards, uh, and the program designs actually influenced uptake of genetic testing, genetic counseling and testing, so it's important to remember that. And if one wants to maximize the number of patients who are, go through reflex testing that are actually referred, embedding navigation with genetic counselors or others is probably key. Um, and uh, we identified a number of important considerations when planning future reflex testing programs, and I'm happy to discuss these uh, with anyone, um, either at the panel or after. Thank you.
I did make one small mistake when I was doing my introductions. Um, Dr. Jessica Hunter is actually going to be talking about integrating genetic testing into managed care. I'm sorry I made you a discussant earlier. Um, <laughs> so that's, or so that was a surprise. And our discussant is Dr. Karen Liu, who's uh, the J. Taylor Wharton Distinguished Chair in Gynecologic Oncology, Onco Gynecologic Oncology for the Department of uh, Gynecology and Quality Reproductive Medicine at uh, the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer, Cancer Center. So if Dr. Linder and Dr. Jenkins want to come up. Thanks, this is a two for one. I'm going to start the presentation, then uh, Lainey will be taking over. Um, I'm, thank you for the uh, organizer for inviting me, and I'm very excited to talk about the Colon Cancer Family Registry because I think it has a lot of information that's uh, pertinent to today's and, and tomorrow's uh, discussions and deliberations. So uh, I'm going to talk about, or we're going to talk about uh, Lynch syndrome research. So Colon Cancer Family Registry does a lot of colon cancer research, part of its Lynch syndrome, and today we're going to be talking about the prevalence of Lynch syndrome in colorectal cancer cases and in the general population. We're going to be talking about the identification of people with Lynch syndrome, the risk of cancer or penetrance, uh, building on the discussion this morning, uh, and the interpretations of variants of uncertain significance, and then the acceptability of testing. So firstly, what is the Colon Cancer Family Registry? Well, it's, uh, it's been going for 20 years now, uh, and I see Daniela Seminara in the audience, who was one of the main uh, uh, motivators behind the, the um, actual in existence of this registry. Um, they're followed up every five years, and um, participants are recruited uh, from the United States, from Canada, and also from Australia and New Zealand. And um, with the prime uh, goal is to be a resource for research. So uh, how's it been going? Well, it's a family-based design. Uh, it's recruitment has recruited 15,000 families. Uh, those families uh, comprise 45,000 participants, and about a quarter of them have had colorectal cancer. And importantly, they've all completed a risk factor questionnaire, a detailed risk factor questionnaire on all the risk factors known for colorectal cancer, uh, over 100 items. Um, they also gave us permission to access their tumours, and we've been able to get uh, almost 9,000 tumours, and they've given a blood sample from which we've extracted DNA. Now, from careful examination, systematic examination of those tumours and the blood samples, we've been able to identify 802 Lynch syndrome families, which comprise uh, 2,118 mismatch repair mutation carriers, and there's the breakdown by gene, and this is the research that... Um, uh, this is the source of data that I'll be basing uh, my talk on. So the first point is uh, uh, looking at mismatch repair mutation carrier frequency in the general population. So Rick got most of these answers right, which is remarkable. Um, so um, <laughs> in many cases, so. Uh, if you just take a random person in the population, the US population, about one in 1900 of them will have a mutation in MLH1. If you take a random person from the population and test them for MSH2, about one in 2800 will have a mutation. MSH6 and PMS2 are more common, which is what Rick foretold. Uh, in fact, three times more common, about one in 700 each. And if you add those up together, it means about one in 280 of the population have a mutation in mismatch repair gene. I think Heather Hample estimated this uh, several years ago around about this number. And what does that mean? If you took a random person from the population and just tested them for a mismatch repair mutation, what you would find is that if you took a random sample from a 50-year-old, a random 50-year-old, uh, of the carriers you identified, 95% of them will have never had a colorectal cancer. If you took a random 70-year-old and tested them, around over 90% will not have had a colorectal cancer. The vast majority of people with a mutation in the mismatch repair gene will have never had cancer before. So if you only focus on the cancers, you're going to miss most of the carriers. There are some programs, of course, and people have talked about these that uh, may improve your ability to identify who's a carrier, even if they're unaffected, MMR Pro and, and PREM 126, and we're developing some new models. So back to now to the cases, and this was also talked about how useful is family history. Well, about 3% of all colorectal cancers have a mismatch repair mutation. Most have little or no family history. At the very top of this cake 
is the, uh, the, the, the Amsterdam or the very strong family history. One in six are mismatch repair mutation carriers, a very rich source of carriers, but that only represents about 20% of mutation carriers overall. 22% of those uh, carriers uh, reside in those with uh, a moderate family history, but the majority have no family history in terms of colon cancer anyway. So if you wanted to find them, family history is not going to be the way to go. If we look at the colorectal cancer cases, and many people have known this, but this is colon, uh, colon cancer family registry data. Uh, this uh, figure shows the probability of mismatch repair deficiency in a tumour by age. And we can see this U-shaped curve where it's equally likely to be deficient for a 30-year-old as it is for a 70-year-old. But of course, the carriers, uh, the mutation carriers, are more uh, in the young group than the old group, given that they're mismatch repair deficient. So about half of the mismatch repair deficient carriers for young people are carriers, and that's about 10 times more likely than those at older age. So it's 10 times more efficient uh, at a young age compared to an old age. You can multiply these together to get the overall probability of being a carrier, assuming that all carriers uh, have a tumour that's mismatch repair deficient. It's about 9% from those uh, with the colorectal cancer in their 30s, which is about 10 times more likely than the colorectal cancer in their 70s. Uh, we've uh, also been looking at the, um, the cause of the mismatch repair deficiency, and we uh, partitioned our population to those under 50 at diagnosis and those at over 50. You can see a very different picture here. The majority of um, uh, the cause for the mismatch of repair deficiency in the early onset is Lynch syndrome. Quite the opposite in, in the older cases is MLH1 methylation. Um, but we also have been doing some of this double somatic work. So these are significant proportions of these mismatch repair deficient tumours are due to double somatic loss. Uh, if you just did the uh, MLH1 methylation and the, micros and the microsatellite instability or IHC, you might conclude that uh, these cases were due to hereditary forms where in fact their relatives are not at increased risk because it's a, it's a non-inherited cause. But of course, this circle here is not the same size as this circle in real life. Under 50s only represent about 8% of colorectal cancer. If we look at it proportional to size, it looks something like this. You look at the red section now, which are the mismatch repair or the Lynch syndrome cases. In fact, more Lynch syndrome cases in terms of absolute numbers reside in those over 50 than under 50. Much higher hit rate in the under 50s, but in terms of capturing most of them, they're more in the over 50s, just because of this huge size of that group. In terms of penetrance, uh, we've seen this a lot, and I won't go into detail, but this is some of the data that's come out of the Colvin CFR. Uh, these are the, the penetrance estimates to age 70 for the different genes, maybe slightly higher for H1 and H2, compared to H6 and PMS2 for colorectal cancer, uh, but for endometrial cancer, maybe it's higher for H2 and H6 than the other two. Now, the important thing is, though, these, these are the one, penetrance estimates that are quoted, but these are just the averages. The averages don't represent what's happening across the whole community. And I think this is one of the most interesting graphs that's come out of the CONCFO in terms of my research is this graph here. This is work done by James Doughty. So this now on the horizontal axis, we have the uh, lifetime risk. So this is a histogram, if you like. There's the average around 40%, which is what I had in the previous graph, 40% risk. But you can see it's not a bell-shaped curve. It's a U-shaped curve. We've got a lot of people that are carriers such as the person that spoke earlier on without a family history, that seem to have a very low risk. They're carriers, they have a pathogenic mutation, these are all pathogenic mutation, but they have no more risk compared to the general population. On the other hand, we have these other people which are almost certain to get colorectal cancer. There's a big distribution. This is not random noise because you would expect a bell-shaped curve. It's pushed out the other way. This is strong evidence for there being modifiers, which our previous spoke, uh, speaker has talked about. So that's where I'm going to finish now and hand over to Dr. Lindor, to Laney, uh, who's going to give her impressions around um, detection of Lynch syndrome. Thank you, Mark. Um, so my apologies to those of you who live and breathe Lynch syndrome here. Some of this is going to be um, too basic, but maybe there are some people here who don't live and breathe Lynch syndrome all the time. Um, so the identification of Lynch syndrome to date has historically revolved around a case of either colorectal cancer or endometrial cancer, and searching for the, uh, the fingerprint of that in the tumor DNA mismatch repair phenotype 
which has been microsatellite instability or immunohistochemistry. And I saw from the previous slide from Canada that uh, almost all the centers have, have um, defaulted to immunohistochemistry for the testing. Um, just a very quick um, uh, overview of some of the pros and cons here is I think this group may be trying to think of longer term strategies here. And the Colon CFR was one of the first groups to try to think about pros and cons here. Uh, microsatellite instability testing has perhaps very slightly greater sensitivity and detection of DNA mismatch repair tumors. Um, it's more ag agnostic with regard to whether this is due to germline or somatic, but it's not pure that way. And it does serve as a functional assay uh, if you have a variant of uncertain clinical significance that pops up. The immunohistochemistry can identify genes underlying a DNA mismatch repair process and therefore narrow down your search requires less tissue, does not require molecular expertise. Sensitivity is about as good as MSI, probably better for MSH6. It generally is less expensive and has a quick turnaround time. On the con side, the uh, MSI has the lower sensitivity for particularly MSH6, though that can be offset somewhat with um, use of mononucleotide markers. It does require molecular uh, labs. Um, the technology is changing, however, and it may be, as Patrick was saying, become embedded in some larger somatic uh, DNA panel that brings in other factors like BRAF and so forth, so uh, need to keep that in mind. And the cons for immunohistochemistry is the expression can be retained, um, so you have a false negative on uh, mismatch, uh, or missense variants in the MMR genes. The weak and heterogeneous staining can make Interpretation quite challenging, and some of the concordance across pathology groups has been distressingly low. Um, and it can be viewed as genetic testing, and if you're doing this as a population thing or as a reflex, uh, there's been conversation about can you do this without consenting individuals first, because you sometimes are sort of telling them they're germline carriers. Um, and of course, the alternative to the tumor testing that's been brought up is that the panel testing are going straight to the germline looking for the DNA mismatch repair uh, variants. And so I have to you know, put out here on the table um, the issue of variants of uncertain significance. The Colon Cancer Family Registry has been um, um, very deeply involved with the uh, development of the multifactorial likelihood model for reclassifying the U.S. Um, this model uh, takes a prior probability of a variant being pathogenic based on in silico manipulations and then uh, uses empirically derived likelihood ratios based on tumor characteristics, based on family history, based on uh, the calculated odds of causality, and then gives you a posterior probability of pathogenicity. It does take quite a bit of data to try to um, reclassify a, a BUS. Um, with regard to VUS and the MMR genes, just something you're going to have to think about if we're talking about this embracing of panels. The Insight Locus specific database um, published their um, reclassification work on 2,400 unique variants, and you can see the distribution that was there. Um, MLH1 and MSH2 are uh, probably overrepresented given their population frequency, but they're most often re uh, recognized for Lynch syndrome the way we detect it currently. Um, about a third of the variants that they looked at were um, kind of no-brainers in terms of uh, they were predicted to be trunking, truncating and therefore pathogenic. About a third could be reclassified based on this uh, multifactorial um, modeling, but about a third remained unclassifiable. And of those third, about 71% occurred in just one family, which means it's going to be really hard or never that you can reclassify those. At, looked at a different way, though. Um, of the submitted test to Insight, only 17% were in this um, unclassifiable category, and Myriad Genetics use, says 6% of what they see is currently um, comes out as a VUS. Those are still numbers that are big if you're looking at population screening, um, but I just float them out there. Um, lastly, um, just a word about the Colon Cancer Family Registry and the return of results um, for mismatch repair testing. Uh, in general, the U.S. sites used a telephone protocol in which a mutation was found in a uh, proband, and then all of the enrolled family members were tested, and then they were all invited to receive their results. Uh, within the context of this uh, research project, 79% uh, of people did opt to receive their results. Um, 
and about uh, three quarters of them said that they had intent to communicate to their relatives and their doctors, and that disclosure um, was predicted for the relatives if the proband had confidence in coping with the genetic result, the disclosure to their physician was predicted if the perceived cancer risk was high and if they also were going to share with their relatives. So um, three quarters of people were willing to um, discuss this with their relatives and that's within a, a group that's predisposed to do research and perhaps curious to start with. So in summary, on the colon cancer family registry, we think about one in 280 people in the population are carriers. Only a small proportion um, of, will have colorectal cancer, and less than half will ever develop colorectal or endometrial cancer. Um, we recognize the risks of cancer and Lynch syndrome are heterogeneous, not just within gene and between genes, but within families. Um, or across families. The tumor testing efficiency for Lynch syndrome does decrease with age because of the MLH1 methylation um, that you saw in the pie charts Dr. Jenkins had. The interpretation of variants of uncertain clinical significance is a major task and not going to go away anytime in the near future, and about three quarters of patients and relatives do accept results of genetic testing. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much to the conference organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, it is quite an honor to be representing the State Health Department at such a prestigious conference, and I do believe that this conference will actually be something monumental and something to be included as a landmark in future presentations for all of us. So I do um, want to thank once again all of the conference organizers for having me here today, but also for holding such a very important conference. Um, I'd like to talk today about the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network, which we affectionately call LESSON. Um, and so I'll be giving you some more information about LESSON, otherwise called the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network. And I do realize that many of the individuals in this room are institutional members of our organization. So the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network was formed actually with the thought of what Dr. Richardson had talked about in actually the first presentation today about the Healthy People 2020 objectives. And the Healthy People 2020 objectives includes an important cancer genomics objective to increase the proportion of persons with newly diagnosed colorectal cancers who receive genetic testing to identify Lynch syndrome or other familiar colorectal cancer syndromes. And this is something as a state health department that we in Michigan have been working since 2009, but we realized we needed more expertise across the nation to actually implement this across our state. That Healthy People 2020 objective, importantly, was able to be um, presented to Healthy People 2020 because of a very strong evidence base that I have to thank CDC's Office of Public Health Genomics for collaborating with the EGAP recommendation and coordinating that effort. And the EGAP recommendation to date, this is the only EGAP recommendation that has come out that says that there is sufficient evidence based on analytic validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility for use of this genetic test for this very specific population. So this is something that as a state health department, because of that EGAP recommendation since 2009, we have been working very hard on. So what also happened, and I have to thank Dr. Corey's group for this as well, that CDC's Office of Public Health Genomics, because of that EGAP recommendation, in 2010, they held a multidisciplinary expert group that said, how could we actually implement that EGAP recommendation on a nationwide basis? And this paper, which was published actually um, in 2012 in Genetics and Medicine, I think could be very relevant to look back at 
um, because it is something that we had looked at and thought about how could this be done on a national level. And when we thought about how implementation could happen on a national level for Lynch syndrome, we thought about using a public health approach, especially thinking about newborn screening as a model of how to implement Lynch syndrome screening. And also we um, addressed the recommendations of a uh, need to address multiple barriers, some that Dr. Lynch actually uh, talked about this morning as well. We also talked about the need for education of many groups, not only providers, but payers, patients, families, and public health professionals. We also recommended national conferences as what is being held today to actually consider furthering that dialogue and how this could happen on a national level. And we also recommended the importance of pilot studies. So with that thinking of what had come out from that expert recommendation meeting that we had in 2010, we, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, received one-time funding at the end of a fiscal year in 2011 from CDC's Office of Public Health Genomics to say what could we do to further this universal screening recommendation for Lynch syndrome. So we turned to who we thought in Michigan were some of the national experts in this. Some were in our state, but many were in other states, including Heather Hample from Ohio State University and Huntsman University in Utah, and what they said is we needed something that was a national network. And so what happened then in 2011 is the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network, or LESSON, was formed. The vision of LESSON is to reduce the cancer burden associated with Lynch Syndrome, and we do that through our mission by promoting universal Lynch Syndrome screening to all newly diagnosed colorectal and endometrial cancers, and we help institutions facilitate appropriate screening by sharing resources, protocols, and data through network collaboration, and we also investigate universal screening for other Lynch syndrome-related malignancies. We do have a board of directors, and I'm very happy to say that three of us are here today, so I am on that board, as well as Heather Hample, who's in the, going to be speaking next, and Dr. Alana Ram, too, from Geisinger. Also, our other board of directors are Debbie, Dr. Debbie Cragen from Moffitt um, in South Florida, and also um, Cecilia Bellcross from Emory University. Membership is completely free. There is no cost to join as a member. Also, there are currently 95 leading institutions in the United States and two in other countries that are members of our lesson network. Also, we had recognized very early on, as Dr. Baxter had mentioned, that with um, Lynch syndrome implementation, that it is something that will take an entire institution. It is not just one individual that can champion those efforts, and it is something that will take the um, engagement of not only pathology, but genetics, surgery, oncology, and hospital administrators, as well as many other individuals within that institution. So we had made that decision very early on in our formation that this is an institutional membership. We have a very, very active listserv. We have developed a database, but it has not been yet launched. So the information that I'll be presenting to you today is based on our membership application data, which does give us quite a bit of information to further Dr. Baxter's story that she had mentioned. We also do encourage research and networking opportunities. We do have different classifications for membership, and this is really based on the ability and implementation readiness of that institution. So we do have individual institutions, the majority of our members are full members, and they must meet all of the following criteria. Those institutions must be currently performing routine tumor testing on colorectal cancers and or endometrial cancers. They also must have the intent that once our database is launched to put that database through their IRB and enter data regularly into our database. There also must be a genetic counselor or other qualified healthcare professional that is trained in providing cancer genetic services is required to be at that institution. We also require that there is access via the genetic counselor or another healthcare provider through to all normal as well as abnormal routine testing results. We also have affiliate members, and affiliate members are typically institutions that are interested in starting routine testing, but yet have not done that, or perhaps have not met one of those criteria or more. Then we also have partner organizations, and a partner organization would be, for instance, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We do not take care of patients at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, so organizations that are advocacy organizations or federal or state agencies that are very interested in promoting the importance of routine screening for Lynch syndrome would be partner organizations, but we don't have the ability actually to care for these patients. 
This is actually our current numbers for each one of those categories. As I mentioned, the vast majority of our members are full members, so we have 75 of those 95 institutions that are currently providing routine tumor testing for Lynch syndrome on all or a subset of colon, endometrial, or other cancers. This is a map that shows where our Lynch Syndrome Screening Network members are by state. We have, as I mentioned, 95 current and active lesson members and partners from 30 states and three countries. I'm happy to say that Michigan has the largest number of Lynch Syndrome Screening Network members with 11. Also, we do collect information estimates estimates about the number of cancers that have been screened at those institutions, and to date, we have had almost 44,000 cancers reported by our member institutions that have had um, screening for Lynch syndrome. The vast majority of those are colorectal cancers, but there are a significant segment of those that are being reported that are endometrial cancers. We also ask on our membership application, when did those institutions start screening for Lynch syndrome? And you can see that one of our institutions, which I believe is Ohio, started in 2004, but the vast majority of our institutions started colorectal cancer screening after that EGAT publication with the highest year being 2012. Typically what we see is a trend that usually within two to four years after an institution implements colorectal cancer screening, they start the endometrial screening, and that's what you see with this graph here, with nine to 11 institutions implementing that endometrial screening in 2014-15. Also, we've asked institutions if they're doing it on all colorectal cancers and endometrial cancers or just a subset, and as you can see, the vast majority of our full members are doing all colorectal cancers, and also a significant subset are doing also all endometrial cancer screening. We also have asked what is the first step in the tumor screening protocol? I believe this was also touched on by Dr. Baxter. And you can see the vast majority of our lesson institutions, their first step for colorectal cancer is IHC, and the same is for endometrial. We do have a website that we have created, and that website is based on implementation and if an uh, institution is either considering that or if they have actually already started implementing. There are many, many resources on there from our lesson members, including examples of tumor screening protocols. There are also tips to increase success, many that were talked about with Dr. Baxter. There's fact sheets on there, patient brochures and letter examples. There's also examples of follow-up information to be given to providers and patients. Key references are also on our website, as well as frequently asked questions. And I wanna also put, take a shout out to Kaiser Permanente Northwest, because they actually did a very extensive evaluation last year about our website, and actually came up with some significant modifications to streamline our website. We also do have a listserv that is very active that anyone within that member organization um, or partner organization can join, and our lesson um, members are quite active on that listserv with posting, I would say, almost daily difficult dilemma cases or information regarding protocols and questions or questions regarding ethical questions or billing issues. And this is, a, for instance, an example that I think was raised in one of the earlier talks today about informed consent, and a question was posted that is informed consent used prior to universal screening, and within three days, 45 institutions responded that could give this other institution some information that there was no informed consent typically obtained. We also, as I mentioned, do have a very um, uh, extensive database that has not quite yet been launched. It has been beta tested. It is HIPAA compliant. We've been having a very difficult time finding a host that's willing to support a national database of over 75 institutions with no or very, very limited financial support. Um, but I'm very happy to say that we have a couple of our um, less than full members that have come forward recently that maybe we have found a home. Um, we also um, have many different uh, data elements that are collected in this. If you'd like to know more information about this, please feel free to see me or either of the two less than Board of Director members that are here today. We have very recently published online um, institutions that are full members, affiliate members, or partner members that were willing to be listed publicly. The vast majority of our members are willing to be um, posted um, publicly, and this is just the first page. So if you'd like to see if you are from an institution or who within your state is actually a lesson member, please feel free to visit that website. Also, I want to thank 
um, Juan Rodriguez and Dr. Lisa Richardson because they do currently fund the state of Michigan as well as four other states to promote cancer genomics and our work can include Lynch syndrome and some of those funds that I do receive from CDC is used to present much of the information that I pre presented to you today. And with that, I want to thank everyone. Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, as most of you know, I've spent the last 20 years working on universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. So this um, meeting is sort of like a culmination dream come true, and I, I hope that um, we are really, truly moving to universal tumor screening. Um, I know, as Dr. Lynch said, it may be antiquated soon, um, but I, I think, you know, some people are even discussing an idea of doing panel testing for tier one diseases on healthy 18-year-olds. Um, and uh, that would be a way of catching everybody and not missing people who have Lynch syndrome. But even if we started that today, there would be billions of people who are over age 18 who would not have had that screening who still need to be screened for Lynch syndrome. And so I think for a long time, we need to take as many approaches as possible to identify all the patients out, here, out there who have these syndromes, including tumor screening for Lynch syndrome, um, until one day maybe we will all know this ahead of time and be able to keep from getting cancer in the first place. Um, so this all started when uh, Dr. Delisha Chappelle um, moved from Finland to Columbus, Ohio back in 1997, and he had done some work on universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome in Finland, uh, which found that 2.8% of colon cancers in Finland were due to Lynch syndrome. The trouble was they had a couple founder mutations in MLH1, and that could mean that the prevalence of Lynch syndrome was very different in America, which has a much more heterogeneous population. Also, people thought no one in America might join a study to do genetic testing at the time of diagnosis, and we had actually had a little trouble getting the study funded originally. Um, so he funded it out of his startup for a while until we had enrolled enough patients that we had pilot data and then did get an R01 from the NCI and conducted the study in Columbus, Ohio at six hospitals from 1999 to 2005, and the main papers on the colon cancer cohort um, were published in 05 and 08. And so here's 10 years of work in one slide. Um, <laughs> we enrolled 1,566 colorectal cancer patients in this study. We did MSI testing at the time because, believe it or not, the antibodies weren't around quite yet, um, and 12% were MSI high. Um, along the way, uh, IHC became available, and we did that on as many cases as we could. All of the cases that were MSI high got methylation testing, and those without methylation who were MSI high got complete genetic testing, and this was pretty complete at the time. We did full um, Sanger sequencing, old-fashioned, for all of the uh, mismatch repair genes. Um, we also did some of the first PMS2 testing using long-range PCR to deal with the pseudogene problem, and once we had MLPA to look for large rearrangements, we were able to look for large rearrangements, too. And in the end, um, we got the same 2.8% that they got in Finland. So one out of every 44 colon cancer patients in Ohio and in Finland has Lynch syndrome. Um, and sometimes when I was showing this data to our surgeons, uh, at, at first they said, oh, all that work, Heather, for, for 44 people. And I said, can you believe this is so high? This is um, an autosomal dominant condition that's going to affect half of these people's brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, a parent, then aunts, uncles, and cousins to, to be at um, one in 44 is unbelievable. Um, when you think of newborn screening, which we do just because you're born in America, the more, most common disease is sickle cell anemia, which affects one in 2,000 African Americans. I'm talking about something that affects one out of 44 colon cancer patients, and we can't get everyone screening for this. It's just crazy. Um, so this is actually super common, and um, we, we looked at those, um, and we also looked at endometrial cancer patients. So we did 563 endometrial cancer patients, many more MSI high cases in endometrial, as we all know, um, did the same testing and virtually the same prevalence of Lynch syndrome in endometrial cancer as colorectal cancer. So it has baffled me over the years why we have so much more trouble getting endometrial cancer patients screened when it's the same prevalence, but we haven't had the benefit of as, as solid pro prognosis data and treatment changes, um, which I think is changing with the immune therapy, and that's going to help us get these endometrial cancer patients screened. So we looked at the um, 44 colon cancer patients who had Lynch syndrome, and the average age of diagnosis was 51. Previously, it had been reported to be 44 in Lynch syndrome families, but of course, if you look at the ge general 
population-based cohort, you're gonna get an older age. And let's not forget my little 87-year-old here who we diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. So I am not a fan of age cutoffs. I think it is much easier for hospitals to do all cases and they won't slip through the cracks if they're doing an age cutoff. And what um, one point I like to make is that 87-year-old not only has children at risk, he has grandchildren and great-grandchildren at risk. And so his descendants are far more numerous than the 30-year-old who we diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. So you really make a big impact, but you do have to screen more patients. Um, I think one of our most notable findings was that half of the cases were diagnosed over age 50, and at the time people were promoting an age cutoff of 50, which would be terrible. We would miss half of the Lynch syndrome. Um, and that 25% did not meet the family history criteria, and I agree completely with the earlier speakers that these are out of date and don't need to be used any longer. Um, and finally, the mutation spectrum was very different than what is seen in high-risk clinics where you see tons of MLH1 and MSH2. Here we start to see MSH6 and PMS2 emerge because we're looking at a population-based cohort. Okay, so here comes the very important part, and that is once you find somebody with Lynch syndrome, you have to test as many of their at-risk relatives as possible. We were able to test 297 relatives of those 44 individuals, and 130 tested positive for Lynch syndrome, most of whom had never had cancer before, and these are the individuals in whom we can intervene and try to keep them from getting cancer in the first place. That was an average of six relatives per proband with three testing positive, which is pretty much the highest I've seen for Lynch syndrome anywhere. But why was that? People have heard me give this talk before. No, it was because the counseling was free, the testing was free, and I would literally drive to their house. If they could get five people in the same place, I was there. We counseled people in McDonald's, we counseled people at their church, we counseled people at their local doctor's office. And um, I, I have to ask myself all the time why we can't do this in our regular clinical practice. As Dr. Lynch said, as soon as these studies end, it's back to handing people a fact sheet and hoping for the best. If we take an aggressive approach, we can identify a lot more relatives, but more on that later. Okay, so um, after that, I, we wrote our paper, and the first letter to the editor said, well, that's nice, but is it cost effective? And thus, I was thrust into the world of public health and cost effectiveness, which was very foreign to me. Um, but I could provide them with the cost of all of these tests and the proportions who would test positive, and people who do this kind of work could do these calculations. I have to give Scott Gross a lot of credit here from the CDC. He did a lot of this work. Uh, in the end, it was found that universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome is cost effective at an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of $31,000 per life year saved. And I said, well, that, what does that mean? I don't do this kind of work. And they said, um, generally anything under $50,000 per life year saved is considered cost effective. And for frame of reference, this is very similar to the cost effectiveness ratio of doing colonoscopies every 10 years in Americans starting at age 50. So it's the same as that recommendation. A point here, this is directly related to the number of relatives who test after you di diagnose those probands. So when we calc this is calculated with six relatives per pro proband. If we did 12, it is more than twice as cost effective because the relatives are where you save the money. Those are the people who you keep from getting cancer. And so cascade testing is what drives and pays for this whole thing. So we have to do it well. The other thing I would like to mention is we actually did test at that time, Patrick, doing gene testing on everybody. Of course, gene testing cost a lot more back then and it got completely dominated. It was, it was not the most cost effective. So it needs to be repeated now that gene testing is panels and much cheaper um, because it maybe has a, a, a better chance of, of getting there. Um, so, Many, many professional organizations, starting with EGAP, have now recommended universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome on all colorectal cancers, and as you can see, the SGO and ACOG have recommended it on all endometrial cancers. So what's the problem? Why are we having this meeting? Well, the problem is this. In 2012, we surveyed institutions, and as we heard this morning, NCI-designated comprehensive cancer centers are doing a pretty good job. In 2012, 71% of those surveyed were doing universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. But look what happens when we get to the community hospitals. Only 15 to 36% of community hospitals were doing universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. Why is that a problem? Because 80% of cancer patients are treated in those community hospitals, and they are not getting the same care as the patients who are coming to the cancer centers. So we needed to do something about this, and this was what was 
the birth of the Ohio Colon Cancer Prevention Initiative. And we thought to ourselves, why aren't they doing it? Well, most of these hospitals don't have cancer genetics professionals on staff. So how are they going to do it responsibly? What do they do when they get an abnormal result? Send them over to Ohio State where they think we're going to steal their patients? So this is probably a challenge that's a barrier for keeping some of the smaller hospitals from implementing this. So the idea behind the statewide study, our Ohio Colon Cancer Prevention Initiative, was to work together as a state, sort of following kind of a newborn screening model, to test every single colon cancer patient for Lynch syndrome at the time of diagnosis, and rely on local genetic counselors or traveling to the center ourselves to provide that follow-up counseling. Uh, luckily, we have a nice bike event at the James, which has raised a lot of money, and they um, elected to support this study, and we're very grateful. There were three arms, and I'm only going to discuss two today. One is the universal tumor screening. The second, Electra Pesquet, here's here in the room, uh, worked on adherence to colorectal cancer screening, which is very important. The third is a biorepository, and these samples are available for research, and these patients have all filled out, or the majority, a nice risk questionnaire. So how did you build a network in the entire state? So we met with the stakeholders in person. We had the track record of success having done this in Columbus, Ohio, and so we had testimonials from our collaborators who, who could say we didn't steal their patients. And these were like people in town who really thought we were going to steal their patients. Uh, they also got nice authorship on papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, so they had very nice things to say about us. Um, we used neutral branding, so we did not put a block O on our materials that the patients saw. We used this OCCPI logo so that they were not thinking we're stealing their patients. The patients stayed local. Their samples were sent to us, so tumor blocks and blood. And for those with the mutations, the genetic counseling was provided by a local genetic counselor. So in Ohio, we're lucky, and we have uh, cancer genetics in Cleveland, Toledo, um, Akron, Canton, Dayton, and Cincinnati. So we have pretty good coverage. Where we didn't have coverage, we would drive there. Um, and they were reimbursed for accrual and for the cost of the pathologist pulling the block or cutting slides. Here's the 50 hospitals. And I would like to say very importantly that we used the two NCORPS, the um, uh, National Community Oncology Research Programs. There's one in Columbus, Ohio, and one in Dayton. That got us 30 of the 50 hospitals with two IRBs, which was critical to the success of the project. You can imagine the number of IRBs involved. Um, here's the results. As of November of 2016, we uh, just finished recruitment at the end of December. We have 3,550 patients enrolled altogether. Here's the results for the first 2,510. Um, we did MSI and or IHC on everybody. 15% um, uh, had defective mismatch repair. We then followed that with methylation, and 37% of the defective mismatch repair patients did not have methylation of MLH1, and that made 142 eligible for genetic testing. They all got paneled at UW um, with the ColoSeq panel, and we found 90 patients with Lynch syndrome. And because we were doing a panel, we found 10 patients with other syndromes who had defective mismatch repair, including biallelic mute YH. So there were 96 patients diagnosed with a hereditary cancer syndrome. We're now up to 3.8% instead of 2.8%, partially because of the panel and the other syndromes, partially because testing's improved, and partially because there was some ascertainment bias because some of the hospitals were doing IHC routinely, and they tried really hard to enroll the patients who were absent MSH2 and 6, for example. Now, you'll note we had 46 patients with unexplained defective mismatch repair. We did tumor sequencing, and 43 of the 46 were were double somatic mutation carriers, including some of the mute YH biallelics, um, who, because that is a repair gene, um, they were prone to acquiring mutations in the mismatch repair genes. Um, so those patients with Lynch syndrome or with unexplained defective mismatch repair all got genetic counseling and cascade testing. The lucky part of this study is a lab offered to test some of the patients who had proficient mismatch repair or methylation, if they met certain clinical criteria, young, positive family history, or more than one primary. We tested an additional 924 patients with a panel and found an additional 2.6% with a hereditary cancer syndrome. Of course, in that arm, because we hope MSI and IHC works, they mostly did not have Lynch syndrome. Only four had Lynch syndrome who had been missed by MSI and IHC, and we know the sensitivity is not perfect for those tests but 64 had other things like BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. If you add this together, we're over 6%, which is close to the 10% Dr. Ugerlin recently uh, uh, published when he was able to screen all comers. Here, 
of course, the missing percent is the group that did not get screened, who did not meet the clinical criteria, who had proficient mismatch repair. I'm running out of time, so endometrial quickly. Basically the same, 3.2%, uh, all Lynch syndrome there. Interestingly, a very high proportion of endometrial cancer patients with defective mismatch repair are uh, double somatics. Seven of the 16, and all seven of seven were double somatics. We did not have the free testing for the uh, mismatch repair proficient cohort in this group. Um, for cascade testing, we've tested 355 relatives and counting. Uh, we have 114 additional positive patients. Um, but what I want to mention here is that even if we were doing really well in getting all the first and second, maybe even third degree relatives on our standard pedigree, that's the tip of the iceberg. And Dr. Lowy um, really inspired me earlier when he talked about better ancestry. We did a great study with Iceland, and Iceland has national ancestry registry. So when you find a positive in Iceland, you immediately know all of the relatives. And I'm talking to eighth cousins, people that don't even know they're related to each other. I have a real super junior genetic counselor who sometimes will say, Heather, we've got four patients with the same mutation. I wonder if they're related. And she'll spend eight hours on Ancestry.com, and by the time she's done, they're six cousins. They don't know it. If you put them in the room together, they've never met each other. If we tried that hard, people have thousands of at-risk relatives in the United States. The ones we could even dare to approach by people they know of are just a drop in the bucket. So maybe we need to be thinking about pairing with Ancestry.com. I got my parents' ancestry testing for Christmas, and I found out they've got second cousins and fifth cousins, and they find out all kinds of unimportant things. What about important things, like potentially being at increased risk for a hereditary cancer syndrome? Um, so project two, I don't have a lot of time to cover. This is Dr. Pasquet's project, but it's not getting mentioned today. So I just want to point out that 96% of people with colon cancer don't have Lynch syndrome. But guess what? Their first degree relatives are at increased risk for cancer. They're at a two to three fold increased risk. So any intervention we're gonna to do to look at all colon cancer patients should not forget the 96% of people who don't have Lynch syndrome, whose first degree relatives are at increased risk and may need to start their colonoscopies earlier and do them more frequently. And so that was the lovely part of having this arm with Dr. Pasquette where our first degree relatives of the negative patients were driven to a website where they got a personalized prescription following NCCN guidelines. So it's, we know their relative here. It says your father was diagnosed at 53. You need to start your colonoscopies at 40 and go every five years instead of starting at every 50 and going every 10. We can save more lives in doing this than we can in the Lynch syndrome arm because while their risk is lower, they are far more numerous. So let's not forget those people too. Okay, so if we did a nationwide project, what would that look like? Say we got half of the people with colon and endometrial cancer in the United States of America in the next three years. That'd be 300,000 people screened. There'd be 11,000 with Lynch syndrome, 34,000 relatives with Lynch syndrome. Oh, most of the people will test negative for Lynch syndrome. 289,000 will test negative. But guess what? They've got 1.1 million relatives at moderate risk. If we do both arms, we can save 63,000 life years. We can save over $3 billion in benefit to the community. And we can avert $816 million of cancer care costs. This isn't trivial. It's gonna cost a lot to do it, but it's going to be cost effective, I believe. Um, a word about alternative screening methods that we've heard about today. You could just germline gene test everybody for a panel of cancer genes, and I keep hearing this especially as the costs have plummeted. And the pro is it's cheap, um, and it does cost less than IHC does at my own institution. You can include multiple genes, not just Lynch syndrome. But the con is that due to volume, patients would not be able to receive individual pretest genetic counseling. They could receive some basic information via a video or a fact sheet, and anyone testing positive could get individual post-test genetic counseling, but we have to decide if this is okay. Um, and a con also is that we still need to do MSI testing now for treatment purposes with immune therapy. And so I prefer this alternative screening method, which has also been alluded to this morning, which would be a new tumor test that incorporates MSI, all of the genes of interest for germline genetics, but also the genes of interest for actionable therapy. 25% of colon cancer cases get RAS and RAF testing because they're stage four. That could be included in the same test. This could replace doing IHC, methylation testing, and germline testing, and it sort of circumvents the people that we scare unnecessarily who have double somatics because you would have a sense that they're double somatic from the start. The other nice thing about it is you find a patient where you think they have a germline mutation, but you're never sure, right, because you're going off variant allele fractions. So then you have the ability to bring them in as if they were a high MSI or a high IHC, offer full 
pretest genetic counseling, and they could opt in or out of confirming that result with a blood sample or saliva. And that would be confirmation with a single mutation test, not another panel. Much cheaper, because you know what you're looking for, you found that mutation. Um, the con, unfortunately, is that the cost of tumor sequencing has not gone down at the same rate of cost of germline testing, but it'll get there soon. And so I think this is an interesting way that a lot of us are, are looking at for potentially um, moving forward in a cost-effective manner and kind of combining a lot of confusion tests into one. Um, and we have uh, screened about 500 of our cases from the statewide study in parallel, and we'll be able to compare the sensitivity and specificity of trying from a tumor screening model very soon. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jessica Hunter. Um, I did want to say that this uh, study that I'm going to talk about today was spearheaded by Katrina Goddard. Um, at Kaiser Permanente Northwest. We're an integrated healthcare system. We serve a little over half a million members in the metropolitan Portland, Oregon area. The main goal of the study was to do a randomized controlled trial because at the time our system didn't have universal tumor screening for Lynch. So the intervention was to screen all newly uh, diagnosed colorectal cancer cases that required surgery. With the control of usual care that relied on physician or self-referral of colorectal cancer cases for genetic evaluation. And in our system, patients can refer themselves for, uh, directly to genetic counselors for uh, genetic screening. With the goal of examining and facilitating the implementation of the screening program. To give an overview of the study, so all new cases of colorectal cancer uh, were randomized to one of our arms. Um, and cases excluded were those that already had a diagnosis of an inherited colorectal cancer, had already undergone screening um, prior to the study, or before we could contact them, they already had contact with the genetics department for evaluation. In the intervention arm, they were contacted and consented, and as part of the consent process, they were told about Lynch syndrome, um, and if they opted out of the study, they were given information of how they could pursue screening for Lynch syndrome outside of the study. So. To get screened for Lynch syndrome, they didn't have to be in the study. Um, and then of those that consented, they underwent the uh, screening protocol. And the usual care arm, we observed them for a year to see if they underwent screening. And then after a year, we sent them a letter to tell them about Lynch syndrome, to tell them how they could get screening for Lynch syndrome through their provider, and then we observed them to see if they actually went to get screening. Um, there were 360 patients that were randomized to the intervention arm. Uh, we, oh, oh no, the, um, the animation is messed up. So we had a 55% uh, consent rate, and of those that opted not to consent, of the top four reasons for not participating in the study that was that they're just not interested, they were too busy, stressed out, we couldn't actually reach them, um, or there were privacy concerns. Um, and then of those that consented, they were given the genetic risk easy assessment tool uh, to determine their own personal and family history of Lynch-associated cancers, um, and then a piece of their uh, tissue was sent for MSI screening. And we actually had an issue in our research study where um, we didn't always have access to the surgical tissue to send off for MSI screening, so it ended up that there were 23 participants in our intervention arm that we couldn't screen. Um, but we ended up having four cases with a high MSI result, and um, they were then contacted by genetic counselors um, to give their result back to them and offer them follow-up screening to either rule out sporadic cases or um, confirm with the germline mutation testing. And then I did want to point out that there were some cases, particularly in the insufficient um, sample group, that our genetic counselors were worried based on their family history, and so they reached out to them and offered them um, additional screening outside of the study. So of these uh, 40 uh, MSI high cases, um, only three declined additional follow-up. The vast majority agreed. Uh, we did have some discrepancies in MSI and IHC results, and it was an interesting case of having one IHC normal case that ended up with an MLH1 VUS. Um, of the additional cases, unfortunately, we had one that um, was deceased before we could finish following up. Nine underwent germline testing, and we were able to confirm a pathogenic mutation associated with Lynch and six. So this is just an overview of those six. 
Um, as you can see, only one case was diagnosed before the age of 50. When we looked to see if they met um, high risk based on selective screening tools, um, two of them didn't meet high risk based on any of them, um, and it was kind of mixed um, within there whether or not they met criteria. Three had no uh, family history of Lynch-associated cancers, um, so they just weren't getting picked up. And then, not surprisingly now, half of the cases, three out of the six for PMS2 mutations. Uh, so overall, to look at the frequency of screening across the groups, 88% um, we were able to do screening for Lynch with MSI in our intervention arm um, of the people that consented. When we went back to the people that actually declined to participate in the study in the intervention arm, only nine ended up going in for screening for Lynch syndrome. So it wasn't that, for the most part, it wasn't that they didn't want to participate in the study, it's just they weren't interested in getting this information. And when we looked at the rate of Lynch syndrome screening in the control arm, 23% had pursued screening for Lynch syndrome through the genetics department. And after a year, when we sent them the letter to tell them about how they could get screening, an additional 25% um, went and obtained screening. So as I said, we identified six cases in our intervention arm. Of those that went for screening and those that declined um, participation in the study but underwent Lynch screening and then those in the control arm that uh, got screened, there weren't any uh, definitive cases identified. But when we went back to that group that was ineligible to participate in the study because prior to contacts they had already reached out to genetics, there were five uh, cases. So we were interested to see what those cases looked like that um, had pursued uh, genetic testing. Um, and so here's the breakdown of those. And as you can see, a lot more of them meet the high risk based on the risk prediction tools. Uh, they tend to be younger, stronger family histories. But interestingly, two of them already had a known familial mutation, just hadn't actually gone, undergone genetic testing prior to this diagnosis of colorectal cancer. Uh, so as part of the study, we weren't just interested in identifying patients. We were also interested in um, trying to figure out what happens after the diagnosis. Do they follow recommended care? Um, how do patients and clinicians view this care coordination? So we decided to look through our system to identify Lynch syndrome cases. We searched the EMR. We did chart review. Uh, we coordinated with our genetic counselors who had kind of an informal Lynch syndrome registry of patients that they knew had Lynch syndrome. Um, and based on our membership size and a conservative population prevalence estimate of one in 440, we expected at least over 1,000 cases. And we identified 73. <laughs> and six of these were patients that we had just identified in our study. So our biggest care gap and one of the more profound things that came out of this study is that we just are not doing a good job of identifying these patients. Um, and so we need to do a much better job. And since the study, um, universal screening has been implemented in our region, so hopefully these numbers will eke up. And when we looked at those that we were able to find in our system, um, the genetic counselors are really good about putting in guidelines for screening and their record. And so we used the guidelines that they were given to determine if they were adherent to the recommended care. And they're very good about um, undergoing their screening colonoscopies, which was really nice to see. Um, and then when we looked at those that had had a cancer prior to a diagnosis versus those that got diagnosed without um, a prior cancer, those that had the cancer before the diagnosis were a lot more adherent to their screening colonoscopies. Uh, we also did qualitative interviews with patients and providers. Uh, we identified 12 patients. These weren't necessarily patients that came from our study. Um, and then 10 providers uh, that had at least one Lynch syndrome patient, patient on their panel. Uh, one thing we noticed when we were looking at adherence to guidelines for recommended care is a lot of patients would come to the genetics department and get the diagnosis and never go back. Um, and that was true for 70% of the patients, which was really surprising because the genetic counselors were telling us, we want to see these people back. We want to make sure that their records are up to date um, and they're getting their screening. And when we asked the patient who they think coordinates their care, uh, two-thirds of them said that they relied on themselves in their primary care. A third of them said that they just relied on themselves. And one comment was regarding the people in genetics, I don't feel the need to visit these people again. I feel like I have all the information that I need. And when we asked the providers who they rely on to make sure that the surveillance care is coordinated, they said 50% of them said that they relied on genetics and the gastroenterologist for the surveillance. 
And one provider said, no, I haven't discussed much with the patient regarding lunch because that's done through the genetics department. So we uh, detected this discrepancy in who uh, views the centralization of care coordination for this population. Uh, for a patient advice on how we can improve lunch surveillance, uh, they want consistent reminders. Um, they want their providers to have more knowledge and understanding about lunch. And they want to be proactively contacted with updated information. And so some uh, quotes from patients is our dental department, our dental program is really good about reminding people to come in for cleanings. They'll remind you that it's time to go in and have your teeth cleaned or whatever, and you don't get that kind of a notica notification from the doctor's side too much. Um, another patient um, wanting their provider to understand more about Lynch syndrome, she said, I recently had a colonoscopy. The provider said, you're over 76, you know, why are you doing this? He even said, with Lynch syndrome, it's ridiculous to do this, you're just overreacting. Well, they got in there and they found five and a half polyps or something like that, so I think maybe in his mind he'll have a different attitude in the future. <laughs> So for providers, uh, what they wanted to see was to set up a population management program. Um, they wanted care coordinated by a dedicated team and not to be their primary responsibility. They wanted clear and consistent documentation in the EMR, and they wanted prompting uh, for any overdue surveillance. And so one uh, PCP said, if we're, going, if we're going to identify these folks, then we need to have some sort of population management system set up, like with Hep C chronic cirrhosis registry. They basically have an RN who manages them. There's enough we have to do in primary care. I wouldn't want that responsibility to be on me to keep up with what kind of screening they need. I think it would be more practical for a dedicated group. Um, and then for automatic prompting, a great crutch I use in our system is the pharmacy. After a year, the pharmacy will send the DACA notice. When I get that message, I go back and look in the chart. Oh my goodness, she's overdue for a follow-up. Uh, so the conclusions of the study were uh, we detected um, of all the colorectal cancer cases that we screened, 3% of them had uh, Lynch syndrome. And of those with Lynch, uh, about a third of them didn't meet at high risk based on any other risk tools that we assessed. Um, and definitely our universal screening program and increased screening for Lynch um, compared to our other groups. But the, definitely the largest care gap that we identified in these studies is that we're just not doing a good job of identifying the cases in the first place. Um, and there's definitely a need for coordination of care following the diagnosis. So with that, I'd like to thank the team, and I appreciate your time. Well, great. Um, that was um, a fabulous set of talks. I'm going to ask for the lights to go on. Um, and uh, I want to start by um, thanking Assad and thanking Kathy uh, for a wonderful um, uh, conference. Uh, I want to thank our panel members, um, and I want to thank you all for um, allowing me to lead this discussion today. Um, we're going to talk for about 40 minutes um, on opportunities and challenges. I want to start by saying I really um, appreciate Andy Dwyer, and where is Andy in the room? Is she here? So she's right up here. Uh, for her perspective as a patient, um, I want to let you know that um, I'm a GYN oncologist, and when I was a new faculty member at MD Anderson, uh, one of my first patients was a referral from Patrick, and she was 40 years old. She had been treated for her um, colon cancer diagnosis. Um, and she had a consistent uh, vaginal discharge, um, and she came to me, and we diagnosed her with um, a uterine papillary serous cancer. Um, it's an unusual histology of endometrial cancer, and she had already had nodal spread, and she had just had her colon cancer surgery um, within the last four months, so she had to have another, another surgery. But it really speaks to this um, importance in, in Lynch syndrome. It's a multidisciplinary um, uh, um, field, and uh, we need to be thinking, putting the patient kind of front and center and uh, genetics, uh, GI, uh, medical oncology, GUN oncology, urology, so many different um, uh, groups need to be um, uh, working together on this, on this issue. Um, I also appreciate Doug Lowy's challenge to us um, to think about how to do this in a more rapid way. Um, this is part of the moonshot. We need to think big. We need to be thinking forward. Um, and uh, we need to be thinking a little bit outside the box. 
Um, and so what is our goal? Um, our goal, it's um, universal testing, but ultimately it's decreasing mortality from cancer uh, in these families that have in inherited cancers. Um, and we've talked a lot about um, what I just so appreciate from, from the work that everyone's done is it's been brute force. I mean, it's been really brute force, whether that's at the state level, the individual level, health system level, um, and, um, and, and I think that, that um, it's going to be both, right? We talked to Heather, talked about how, is it, how are we going to kind of achieve this. It's going to be both through thinking outside the box, but also um, uh, brute force is going to get us there. I did want to mention, and I think it's been mentioned a little bit, um, disruptive technology. Um, and I think that, that we need to be thinking about that and how do we incorporate that um, into our plans moving forward. So I want to talk about low-cost testing, um, $250, it costs $250 today to send in your spit and get tested for multiple genes. So it's cheap and it's only going to get cheaper. And, and we're so close to free testing, right? That's what was, that's kind of the, what Heather's saying is the core of how we were successful. So let's think about that um, and think about that in relation to tumor studies. Um, and think about it, that in terms of our unaffected, our family members. So, you know, probably tumor testing and all those expensive things we want to think about for our, our colon cancer or endometrial cancer patient, but for those unaffected, that's where we're going to really need to be thoughtful about bringing in that cheap testing. Um, the other disruptive technology that we need to take advantage of is IT. We need our sons and daughters to help us with that. Um, we're too old. Um, but there's so many areas where that can be helpful, right? Navigation, we talked about navigation. Um, registry and databases, pull, pulling that together. Um, consenting online. Um, so we're, we're doing a study. Um, our, uh, one of our, our senior um, administrators and research uh, who moved to MD Anderson said, you know, I signed for my mortgage on my phone. How come we can't do clinical trials that take advantage of online consenting? Um, so we've just worked through um, uh, at MD Anderson how to do online consenting so that we can expand these families um, in a much more readily available way. What about Ancestry.com? That's a great idea. Again, using IT as a disruptive technology. Um, and then finally, I want to to say the third one is targeted therapies for MSI high tumors. That is a disruptive technology, and I tell you that. Um, also looking at the whole BRCA world. I've been pounding, I've been doing brute force and, and asking my uh, human oncology partners to do testing for BRCA um, in ovarian cancer patients. And it was not until PARP inhibitors were FDA approved um, that we've actually moved forward. So that is a disruptive technology for us. And why do we need to think about that? Um, the reason is because we're going to be doing things in parallel, okay? We're going to be doing germline testing and tumor testing in parallel. So if a patient comes to me with an advanced fifth-line ovarian cancer, I'm going to think about doing kind of somatic testing for HRD, for homologous recombination deficiency, because now there are drugs that show that you don't necessarily just need a BRCA mutation, but if you have um, some other cause of homologous recombination uh, deficiency, you're going to be um, uh, be particularly um, receive benefit from a PARP inhibitor. So don't just think tumor testing or just think uh, germline testing. These things are going to go on in parallel. And look to, um, look to BRCA because that's what we're dealing with, with right now. So right now kind of ASCO has put together a group to look at, you know, how do we incorporate germline and somatic testing um, in the management of women with ovarian cancer. So with that, I'm going to open up the floor, um, and we have about uh, half an hour uh, to talk about these different things. I want to talk about access. I want to talk about alternative delivery models. Um, I want to talk about multiple approaches. I want to talk about cost, and then I want to also save some time to think about harm, okay? So again, putting the the the, the um, the individual, I don't want to say patient at risk, because these could be pre-vivors, right? We, we have, if we do this right, we have this entire generation of unaffected individuals who are at high risk for cancer, and I think we need to think about how do we help them and how do we not impose harm on those individuals. So please introduce yourself before you ask your question. Thanks, Dr. Liu, and um, Ned Kwan's the Colorado Trust. Um, I, I just... So you know it's moving so rapidly. 23andMe is now 199. Okay. And had you done it in time, you could have gotten the Valentine's Day <laughs> discount to 149. So any number we quote is in flux and changing. I actually had a specific couple of questions for Dr. Baxter. So uh, question one is how many other provinces 
are addressing this screening? And the second question is how did Ontario make the decision to start pursuing this program? Um, so there's one other province that has implemented it, and that's Manitoba. And they're, um, they have a model that's very similar to Western Australia in that they're a major one major referral center, which is Winnipeg. Um, so it makes it a little bit more of a nimble system to make changes than most of the other provinces that are, have uh, cancer centers that are more distributed and populations that are more distributed. Um, uh, BC is implementing it at their cancer center, which has a fairly broad reach, but it's not 100%. So I believe Ontario is the only larger province that's really trying to do this widespread. Why in Ontario? Honestly, it's because the head of our prevention and screening um, group at Cancer Care Ontario is a gastroenterologist. Uh, and so I think that that's one of the major drivers to thinking that this is a key thing to focus on. Also is that we have implemented and had success in our high-risk screening program for breast cancer. So a province-wide, population-based, high-risk screening program so the question was, what's next, and what's next is this. Coming up. Lisa Schlager with Force. Thank you for the incredible presentation, so informative. Um, I, I wanted to talk about uh, coordinated care, definitely something that individuals affected by hereditary cancer are craving. Um, it's a lot of work to organize that appointment with the breast surgeon and the, the gynecologic oncologist and the regular oncologist and the primary care. So I think the centers that are offering a coordinated care program um, really are seeing better uptake and uh, utilization of the screening. Um, in regard to harm, um, I was fascinated by what's uh, happening in Ontario, and I'm curious to know how you manage or, or what the culture is for pre-vivors or unaffected carriers who are found to carry a hereditary cancer mutation. Um, for instance, here in the U.S., uh, we're not protected from discrimination in life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance, and that can be a deterrent for people getting tested. Um, I have relatives who are concerned about testing for that very reason. They're primary breadwinners and they're fearful that they may not be able to get additional insurance should they need it. So how is that handled in your area? And um, is it something that I think if we're going to start considering universal testing and, and testing more widely, maybe we need to address some of these issues at home so that uh, we're protecting our citizens who are willing to go through with us? You want to comment, Heather? I was thinking you might be good for coordinated care because you guys have that great model where you do their endometrial biopsies while they're sedated for their colonoscopy. We, we do have a gastroenterologist who now acts as the point person for our Lynch syndrome patients and that our patients love that. That still, they don't get everything in one stop, but at least he makes sure everything's ordered for them, and that's been a dramatic improvement. But I would love to be even more integrated. You're absolutely right. We make things very hard for people to get um, done, and then we wonder why they're not doing them. So we definitely need to improve that. But just even a small change of having one person play a quarterback is a huge help. And I, I think it really speaks to this concept of kind of um, multi-organ prevention. Um, and so why not be thinking, kind of those of you in the audience who are prevention, um, and I think we're going to hear more about chemo prevention, but, you know, we need to look at kind of multiple organ sites because, uh, again, that's a patient-centered approach. Um, you know, we've been doing combined screening while the individual is getting their colonoscopy and they're already sedated. If you've had an endometrial biopsy, it's not the most comfortable thing. We've been doing it for about 15 years. Years, and we've really tried to get other um, uh, institutions to pick it up, but it's hard. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, as uh, doctors are asked to work more and um, it's, hard, it's hard to do that. But let's think again, IT, can IT help us? Um, even we do a pretty good job, but what about, you know, kind of, what about, um, you know, screening for ureteral, you know, malignancies, what, you know, someone's forgetting that piece. And that's why the genetic counselor, I have to say, you know, has always been um, a central part of this, a central part of that navigation. Um, but it, it is a challenge. I think the hope in Ontario is to have a program. So, and the program to involve best practices in terms of screening both for colorectal cancer as well as for other cancers. I mean, that, that's a hope. Um, in terms of screening for colorectal cancers, I think your point about harm uh, is a very good one because there's a variation in terms of quality of colonoscopy. 
And so we have to ensure that these people who really need high quality colonoscopy are scoped by, by providers that are qualified and uh, skilled. Uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the, uh, the legal um, um, uh, issues, they're a major concern for, for patients and for their families. Um, that came up in our, uh, in our um, group meeting, um, very much top of mind, although there's never been a case of individuals who were refused uh, insurance because of this, and we don't have a medical system. We have some. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you could see why wouldn't an insurer Fuse, right? Um, it's going to become more and more of an issue, and, and it's one of the barriers to actually doing panel testing or, or wider testing up front, right? Where right now we're kind of skirting the ethics of needing informed consent to do these tests because they're pathologic tests. We have pretty good buy-in in, in, um, in Ontario to say that we don't need consent before we do these. But once we start getting any further, uh, I think we're really on thin ice in terms of needing informed consent to do these. Uh, uh, Jules Pameter from Salt Lake City, from Huntsman Cancer Center. Uh, wonderful talks for the entire day today. I had really two questions or comments. One was about, you know, some of the nice presentations we've had from Lainey and from Heather about putting together large hospital systems or registries to look at the epidemiology, essentially, of uh, Lynch syndrome. But really taking this to the next step, I think, is can we use some kind of a infrastructure or consortium throughout the U.S. to run early detection uh, trials or prevention trials? Europe is ahead of us in that. We really don't have that. You know, Eduardo has run a trial on naproxen and Lynch syndrome. We've run one with FAP, but almost to some extent putting things together with just friends and people you know at different centers and then using DCP or NCI as some form of infrastructure, but not a really well consolidated infrastructure where you have like SWOG or other um, chemo, uh, cancer, cancer treatment groups where you have 20, 30 members and you can advertise a trial and recruit from all of these centers. So as we have universal screening in all of the Ohio hospitals, the Utah hospitals and academic cancer centers, how can we build an infrastructure to run trials around that. I think chemo prevention, fecal DNA, or blood uh, liquid biopsies, all of these can be run with that. So that's one comment maybe you guys can touch on. And then the other one I had was, you know, looking at uh, cascade testing or relative, uh, finding relatives. You know, in Utah, we have a genealogical database, very similar to Sweden and other countries. But even there, we have logistical problems of how do you merge the data from genetic testing studies, which we have at the University of Utah and at Intermount Healthcare, the two health centers comprise 95% of all cancer care in the state. So all genetic testing, again, would largely be done by these. But then merging that with the Utah population database to find at-risk relatives. We can do that from a research point of view, which some of our groups are interested in in Utah. But taking that to the clinical, how do you then let those patients know and do that. That is the logistical issue of HIPAA and everything that we've heard about. But even in a state where we can find your first, your second, your third, out to really your fifth degree relatives, um, it, it has been a challenge. So, great. Anyone want to take that on? Everyone is just shaking their head in agreement. <laughs> I couldn't agree more about getting a group together to to that we can quickly put out any kind of chemo prevention trial. And I know this is something the Collaborative Group of the Americas on Inherited Colorectal Cancer really feels like we need to step up our game on. And so I think there's some idea around maybe using that group. Um, also, we have the lesson group. There's there's groups where you at least know there's a bunch of people doing universal <coughs> screening that we could approach. But I think you're right. I, I think we've we've not done a good job, and it is just calling friends when you want to collaborate on a, on a study. And we need a more formal kind of organization that keeps track of what we all have um, so that you know um, and can get those studies funded in the first place. Because if you don't have the patients, you're not going to get the study funded. And I think maybe that's kind of one of the outcomes from this meeting. Perhaps tomorrow we'll talk, Asad, Lisa, you know, kind of what's the role of the CDC, what's the role of, of NCI in kind of helping. And also, can, can we use things within the NCI? Can we use the cooperative groups? Can we use NCOR? Um, you know, we need some kind of help navigating all that. Well, thank you for that. So I'm Bertie McCaskill Stevens. I'm the director of the NCOR, but I just oh, wanted to. Uh, I set you up. <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, make a comment because this uh, past year we made a significant effort to, to uh, reinvigorize, invigorate uh, 
screening. And uh, actually, we just published that in the Journal of uh, Cancer Prevention for AACR. But uh, importantly, you know, we've had a history of doing those types of trials in a very, very large way. Uh, but, you know, I, I think you've identified some of the barriers. And one of the things that we were doing concomitantly as we re began to have uh, trials, actually two screening trials that are uh, going forward, um, is to provide some assistance. Many of our investigators have asked us, how can NCI help? And, and the issue of integrating and engaging primary care physicians. So we have put into place a working group of actually a very nice cadre of various non-oncology specialties to help us um, in engaging and, not, and becoming champions for this and helping us work through the barriers. So the NCOR, I think, is a nice laboratory for doing that. There are integrated systems. There are smaller practices. There are a lot of variety of organizations that are able to do so. And they are actually charged within the RFA to engage primary care physicians. Positions, and now we actually have the tools and the trials and the research to do so. So we're happy to take any uh, comments and questions, you know, in helping to do this. Thank you so much. I think if we're going to have a successful outcome and really have a path forward, we're really going to need kind of um, you all to let us know what are the opportunities for that. So thank you so much. And I'll just plug the front end of that um, program. So. DCP also has an early phase consortia program through which Eduardo is conducting his NSAID study so that we can conduct those early phase studies that we can then move into larger studies within the NCORE program and the cooperative groups. Um, so Heather, in your uh, presentation, you mentioned two different um, genetic testing. So ColoSeq was used for the people who were MSI high. And then my risk was used for the other group of people. I know we're, we're going to talk about testing later this afternoon, but because of these two different tests, I wondered if you could comment on the different, but difference between those two tests and why different tests were used other than one agreed to provide funding so that their tests could be used. Yeah, that's why. That's why. So, um, so there, um, the ColoSeq is a next-gen panel that the University of Washington offers. Lots of labs offer different panels now. And um, for the most part, on these next-generation sequencing panels, you're getting nice sequencing and large rearrangement detection of a set of genes. Um, the ColoSeq one is colon-specific genes. Um, and my risk is a 25 uh, pan cancer panel, 25 gene pan cancer panel, so I had sort of a variety of genes. Um, we would have preferred to use one lab for everything. We did not have enough money to do that. And so if the um, one, if Myriad hadn't offered to test those patients who had proficient mismatch repair for free, I couldn't have tested them at all. Um, and, so, and we've been wondering how much we're missing over in the proficient arm. So it was an awesome opportunity, and we're very grateful to have that. Um, luckily, UW runs ColoSeq on a, a BROCA panel. For those of you in the audience who do a lot of gene testing, that's a, a much larger panel that has breast cancer genes on it. So we were able to have them look at the same 25 genes that UW had so that we had some, uh, so that the same set of genes got looked at. Uh, those 25 got looked at in both groups. The converse we could not do. So there's a number of interesting colon cancer genes that were done on ColoSeq that were not included in the Myriad panel. And, and those are probably the patients who were most likely to have them, the proficient mismatch repair. So it, it pains me. So we didn't, early on, we don't know about Pol E, Pol D1. A lot of uh, important colon cancer genes were not included on that arm. So it's always this is an underestimate of the number of hereditary cancer syndromes out there. Thank you. And with that underestimation, um, I, I think there's uh, two separate things that need to be addressed through educating a variety of different folks, including providers as well as part, um, you know the public, um, the pro bands, the previvors. The part of the issue is that you can do all the testing, you can do the universal testing, but then the question comes back, okay, so what is my risk? And I look to the cascade testing that we're starting with ovarian cancer, and you can pre-identify those women who are at risk with the BRCA mutations, and they can have prophylactic surgeries, and then a cohort of them are going on to get other kinds of cancers that don't save them from the cancer experience, they still go through it. Only now they've had, if you will, they've had the prophylactic surgery, which had one set, and now they've gone through another cancer, which nobody recognized, and they have that. And so when you go back to Andrea Dwyer's um, original presentation this morning, where she said uh, a number of patients 
have PTSD from genetic testing. When you look at the presentation from Kaiser, where 50% of the patients said, I'm not even interested. And then you look at the ovarian cascade uh, testing where not everybody wants the information. I think some of it may not be that they're misunderstanding or uneducated. They may simply be saying, don't tell me unless you know that I, unless you can tell me something specific. You can tell me my risk is 10%. Okay, well, my risk for driving in a car may be not all that much different. My risk for going to certain parts of the world may not all be that different. So I think some of this needs to be thought in the framework of maybe people are not accepting the testing because there's insufficient information to take an action. And a lab is the perfect case and the perfect scenario with BRCA and ovarian cascade testing because now you have not only treatment for the patient with the disease, you also may have something for earlier stage patients as well. That's a fantastic um, comment, and let's kind of move a little bit into harm because I I, um, I worry about that. Um, so I'll kind of give you the specific scenario. So, um, you know, I get sent patients who are tumor study positive, um, but have an unidentified mutation. So who had colon cancer at a young age, they're tumor study positive, they don't have a mutation, and then they get sent to me for um, a GYN screening. So what do I tell that person is their risk for endometrial cancer, and what do I tell them to do? And then what I'm seeing more of is I'm seeing more of their relatives now coming. We don't have an identified mutation in that colon cancer patient, and we don't, we, so that we therefore cannot take advantage of precision prevention, and they're sent to me, and are we causing them um, kind of, um, you know, PTSD or something, anxiety related to that, um, and we don't really know what to do. So let's kind of talk about that just for a few minutes. Um, kind of, anyone want to comment on that, Lainey? You want to take a go at that? Um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's um, lots and lots of uh, surveys have been done of people's interest in genetic testing, and there's always a to some proportion of people who don't want it for whatever reason. And I think they're always going to be there. And we can't um, make them do it. So I think we're going to have to accept that there is some baseline of, of that going on, be it for philosophy of life or, or whatever reason. Um, but for the, I think um, a lot of the panel testing that has come out has come out um, prematurely from traditional clinical um, standards in terms of us knowing what it means and how to interpret it. And we really lack a lot of evidence base for how to do effective screening. And I'd love to sit down with you and hear, how are we doing on ovarian and endometrial screening these days? It's in all of the guidelines, and I have yet to see anything that shows efficacy. And, you know, if we're trying to do cost effectiveness, Weighings and not traumatizing people and making them have pain and cost. You know, we need to get our ducks in a row in terms of um, the screening efficacy piece. So we have a lot of science to go, but the horse is out of the barn, and we have to do the best we can right now. Um, and I think the upfront conversations with people about what they can live with, their degree of being able to live with ambiguity and, and, and that sort of thing is, is pretty important to not push people into things that they're uncomfortable with, give them time to process it, to consent to the ability that you're able to consent. And I, I just want to say to, to Mark, it's really helpful to kind of, you know, because there, we see so many, you know, we've been doing universal testing, we're really good about it, but then we identify all these individuals where we can't find a mutation. You know, having that kind of somatic cause now, is that something that's available? It's, to how do you, you know, how, how do, would a community hospital who's trying to figure out, you know, they've identified someone as having abnormal tumor studies, um, they can't find a mutation, you know, how would a community hospital access, because um, I think that would help in terms of decreasing that background noise. Well, a third to the American. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in the U.S., there was only one lab doing that testing. That was University of Washington, but now Ambry Genetics is also doing that testing. 
Um, but I have to say there actually are places now, and when you look at my endometrial data with almost an equal odds of being double somatic as having Lynch syndrome, um, thinking of the approach of, of starting with um, that tumor sequencing, because they always run blood in parallel. You'll pick up your germline cases, but you'll also pick up your double somatics. Instead of having to do two tests, which talk about test fatigue, we test fatigue people out by doing one at a time over this long period of time. As much as we can do um, in one test, I think, uh, we're going to see a change in practice with that. I mean, then just back to the, the question about education, I, I, I couldn't agree more, and I think it starts with the general public. And uh, two anecdotes, one was an 18-year-old who I was counseling because she was at 50% risk for Lynch syndrome, and her mom, I could tell, was very mad at me the whole session. I couldn't really tell why until I got to the part where I explained that colon cancers are preventable um, because they start as a polyp most of the time, and that if we start the colonoscopies early enough and do them frequently enough, we have a chance of preventing the colon cancer. And her daughter ended up testing positive, and by this time she was my best friend. And I said, you know, you didn't seem really into this at the first visit, and she said, I didn't think cancer was, colon cancer was preventable, and why would you want to know you were walking around with this gene that gives you a high risk for getting cancer if there was nothing you could do about it? And that's just such a basic thing that all of us know, but the general public doesn't know, that keeps people from coming in. And, and, and um, we had to, um, between the years of the study, we'd call people on the phone when they had abnormal tumor sequencing, or tumor screening, not sequencing, and we'd say, you know, it's more likely you might have her hereditary cancer syndrome. Do you want to come in? We'll explain this. And, you know, I can't tell you the number of people I'm calling 75-year-old ladies who said, oh, honey, my, my girls are clean living girls. They'll be fine. And, and <laughs> I was like, I'm sure they are, but there's a, you guys might have a hereditary cancer cancer syndrome that gives you an increased risk no matter how clean living they are. And, um, and so you were fighting sort of this general lack of knowledge in the general public. And, I, and once I got family members in front of me, only one ever declined testing. And not that I forced it in any way. I think once you hear the information and the compelling argument and the fact that the cancers can be prevented, most people elect to find out. They also hear that if they don't get tested, they need to screen as if they're positive. And so the, there's the benefit of possibly being negative if you get tested. But it's the people who don't get in front of us in the first place. They're voting with their feet, and those are the ones where we aren't, we've got to do something about. Go ahead. Blood panel testing from the oncologic perspective, because certainly we use mutations in KRAS and NRAS to, to determine who would not benefit from anti-EGFR therapy. We use KRAS and ERAF mm -hmm. for prognostic purposes. I just want to underscore the, the importance and the urgency of what we're doing, because we know in the MSI population, the, the benefit of immunotherapy in the metastatic colorectal cancer setting is very, very impressive. And we've developed through the Alliance Cooperative Group a trial for patients with stage three uh, MSI colon cancers that looks at an anti pdl one antibody, atezolizumab, with a uh, combination with full FOX versus standard full FOX treatment. So we're really going to be accruing this study, probably open it in May. We want 700 patients. And of course, we need universal testing to be able to identify patients who uh, could potentially be cured from this uh, intervention for the trial. Yeah, it's exciting to, to see that. Congratulations. I think we have a web question, so we'll do that. We have a couple of questions from WebEx participants. So the first is, uh, per, Heather's, per Heather's presentation, there are low rates of uptake of, of universal low uptake of universal screening in the community centers, but there's also there are fewer genetic counselors in those settings. How can we increase both in parallel is the first question. That's a good one, and there is going to be a talk later from Joy larson Hydley about workforce issues and genetic counseling, so I'll let her address those issues. Um, but I, I will say that there are um, uh, the, the data um, for, were from 2012. I think that study needs repeated because it's definitely been increasing, so it may not be quite as bad now. You know, certainly we would hope it's more than 15 to 36 percent of community hospitals, but we, we don't know. Um, so that needs to be studied. And they, uh, we are working on alternative service delivery models, ways to get access to cancer genetics, an, an approach like we did in the state where we work together as a team is one. I ended up actually using some of the telephone genetic counseling services quite a bit in my study because because it turns out people's relatives don't all live in Ohio. And so I had a lot of out-of-state relatives who needed counseling and testing. And it's very tricky now in the age of EMRs to get a, a patient tested or counseled for free. I had the money to pay for their counseling, but they, they couldn't see them and, and put a visit in an EMR without dropping a bill. And, and so I had, I had trouble even referring them if they were near a cancer genetic counselor. So we were able to use the telephone genetic counseling service and pay them. Um, and it was great, super effective. The other nice thing is patients can do that on 
on evenings and weekends, and so it doesn't interfere with work, which is a major barrier for a lot of patients. Um, so I think that's going to be an increasingly um, great way to get access to genetics for people who don't have one on staff. I also would say most places, we, we started providing cancer genetics for some of our smaller community hospitals, and within two years, they usually realize they have enough volume to support their own counselor or three. Um, they just don't know what what's in their, their patient population, so they, they have to start somehow. Um, but hopefully we can improve both. Great. We have a second question about how many sites are there, cons persons concerned about how many sites are not doing studies to rule out double somatic mutations. Can anyone comment on how frequent that would be or people looking at the double somatic mutations? It's about one in ten um, tumors that are micros the mismatch repair deficient. So your data showed, and that's what uh, Dan Buchanan's data showed as well. It varies a bit by age, but it's it's very common. It's very common. One in ten. Uh, so just to clarify, amongst MSI high tumors, one in ten will have um, double somatic. Yep. Okay. Well, it's two studies we've just shown. Okay. Okay. But in terms of uptake, I, I don't have a good sense um, of how many places are, are taking it to that next step. Um, it, it is. It is a lot. A lot of insurance companies will only pay for a panel once. Um, so for Medicare, for example, if you've done a germline panel on the person and it's negative, they will not cover the tumor sequencing. And so this is what's driving some of this idea of, of shifting when you've got a defective mismatch repair patient to maybe doing both in parallel. But it's not widely available yet. So I, I think probably it's not being used as widely. And, and it's a new phenomenon. The papers have come out in, say, the last two years. So there's always sort of a, a time lapse till it gets widely adopted. All right, Rick. Uh, Rick Boland, uh, just a suggestion regarding implementation. I think we should develop a new profession, a mid-level, not a genetic counselor, not a physician, who takes care of hereditary colon cancer. I think it would answer a lot of the questions that we have. I had a, a person come to me when I was in, in Dallas, and she was a genetic counselor, and she became a nurse practitioner. I said, this is it. And um, unfortunately, the hospital didn't think that they could make money on it, which is kind of an awful thing. But but the fact is that that would be the kind of person who could send out those little dental yeah. messages about, you know, getting your colonoscopy or, or you know, having those – that would not drop the ball because everybody else is in a silo. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. Well, on that point, John Bird, Newcastle, my colleagues in Newcastle have rolled out genetic risk assessment practitioners, basically upgrading ward nurses, giving them a training in colon cancer management just for the colon cancer. So, what I want to raise, to go back around to your point about um, safety, um, as I, just to pick up a point for a slide I'll show later, which annoys Rick, uh, is that actually if you do annual colonoscopies to 100,000 people, that's a million colonoscopies, you're going to kill people. Uh, and we don't talk about it very much, but actually you're more likely to kill them with a colonoscopy in that population than you are with aspirin, yet we agonize about the risks of aspirin and never mention the risk of colonoscopy. But that leads to a second point. The prospect of Lynch syndrome database is running across several countries in Europe now. We're following people from their first colonoscopy towards the future to see how many cancers they then get to try and get away from some of this ascertainment bias. And one of the papers we're having typically getting published is the one that compares colonoscopy frequency with cancer risk. But it's not different. It's actually a higher risk of getting colon cancer in Germany where they do annual colonoscopies than there is in Finland where they do three yearly colonoscopies. Mm. And everyone says that's, well, actually, Rick's it because they're all crappy colonoscopists. Uh, but actually, um, I wasn't supposed to quote that, was I? Sorry. Um, but actually, I mean, certainly, you know, we've now got very, very rigid control of our screening colonoscopists. They have to publish their results, mm -hmm. etc. I don't think that's the explanation. I think there's something about the, the way this cancer progresses. It comes up fast and then it stays for a long time before it spreads and then goes. So I think there's a big window to catch it. And so presuming we have to do ever more frequent colonoscopy was a, a natural, understandable mistake in my mind. We have no proof that actually doing more frequent colonoscopy saves lives or prevents a lot more cancers, and I think we need to really think about that. That's something that should, we should investigate in this moonshot because if we're going to avoid harm, yeah. we don't we actually do more colonoscopies than we absolutely have to. Yeah, fantastic point. Great. Um, Catherine Kopdiak from Huntsman Cancer Institute. This question's for Heather, actually. So 
You mentioned that you had an uptake of testing for about six family members per proband. And I'm and you mentioned that telephone was helpful to reach out to those family members. Were there any specific communication tools that you guys found more um, successful than others to um, you know help those uh, patients reach out to their family members and communicate that genetic and health information um, to increase the likelihood of them coming into clinic and getting testing themselves? Unfortunately, we didn't study that part very well. Um, we we would still work through the proband. We weren't calling the relatives directly, um, which I think would be a major improvement that I know Dr. Lynch is working on. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it all had more to do with things like, you know, if you could get five people in the same room, we'll come to you. So suddenly they're trying to get five people, so I'll drive there, right? So, um, and um, even we noticed um, in the last six months, if you would say free testing is ending in six months, suddenly everybody can. I mean, it's just crazy simple stuff. So there should be better ways, obviously, but sometimes it's the most basic things like that, that made people reach out a little bit more and find that fifth relative so we would drive to them because that was much, no one wants to drive to Columbus and park in the parking garages at OSU. If I had made, our, if we had required those patients to come to Columbus for their counseling, I venture to guess I would have, I would have counseled and tested about 10% of the relatives I did. And, and what's sad is when my studies end, I'm back to, here's your fact sheet, I hope your relative goes in, <laughs> here's the name of a counselor in Texas, give them a call, and hoping. Hi, Alana Kolchak Rom from Geisinger, and um, this is sort of a, a comment and a question for, I guess, the whole room um, related to what we were just talking about with the coordinated care. Um, so one of the things that we're trying out at Geisinger is um, more of a multidisciplinary care clinic, um, and so we have two inherited risk clinics that we've started up, inherited breast clinic and inherited colon clinic for our patients who test positive. Um, both clinically and through our MyCode population. Um, so obviously if you have a BRCA or other inherited breast risk mutation, you go to inherited breast clinic. Um, colon mutation, you go to, to inherited colon clinic. And this has, you, it, it's the coordinated, the, the multidisciplinary clinic model where you go and you see your breast surgeon, your, um, the, the oncologist, everybody that you need to see to, to get you introduced into the system, figure out what your process is going forward and to make sure that you have a plan going forward um, and that you've now been connected to all of those specialties who need to take care of you. So it's not necessarily one person doing this over time and making sure that they're getting their um, colonoscopies or their breast screenings and, and all of that, but it, it's this care clinic model. And I, I think there's other places out there doing this. And so maybe this is an opportunity to study this other model as well as maybe, maybe that something like this inherited risk model. But I know there's also issues with payers. Um, I know at Geisinger, you come in for the one visit, but you have five copays, one for each of the different providers. There's issues of documentation. Um, in the EHR as well. Um, so it's, there, there's all sorts of implementation issues with that as well. But I think it's something worth considering. Um, our patients so far really like it, and we're doing some other work to, to study some other outcomes of it. But. Yeah, that, that concept, I think, first of all, I think that health systems that really drive towards value-based healthcare are going to be helpful uh, because they're going to kind of hold us accountable to do things that are kind of um, effective, uh, cost-effective, and patient-centered. So, um, yeah, I think that's fantastic. Okay, I think we've got one last question, um, and then we'll have lunch. So. Thank you for today. It's been very enjoyable. I look forward to the rest of the sessions. I'm Amy Blanco from University of California, San Francisco. We have also recently developed a what we call the hereditary cancer clinic as a means to provide coordinated care for all positives regardless of indication. It's a team of genetic counselors and a primary nurse practitioner um, as well as trying to pull in the various specialists who have been seeing these patients over the years, but that's our largest challenge at the moment is um, engaging the physicians across the various disciplines that are needed to take care of all of these various organ systems. Um, so I'd love some advice from those of you in the room if you've been successful at bringing in 
the various physician groups and how you managed to convince them that the time and effort and perhaps reduction in the number of patients that they can see in their GI clinic or their breast clinic going down when they come to coordinated care clinic um, is a tough nut to crack, and I'd love any advice of people who've been successful. Anyone have any quick advice before we have lunch? Okay. okay. My name is Jane Pareto. I work in the Veterans Health Administration. And I think this speaks to the EMR and really taking advantage of its IT um, infrastructure. We can set up recall reminders for providers, for patients, uh, automatically get follow-up. We're never going to remember when you're follow-up, but we can enter it. And then the computer will prompt it, mail it out to the patient, come up as a pop-up message for the provider. So I think there are really mm -hmm. other ways to maximize and utilize um, the resources yeah. we have available. Future-looking yeah. ideas. Yeah. So that might be. I just wanted to add to that comment. So the VA is interesting. It's an integrated healthcare system, and so that's the answer to the question, right? <laughs> so if, if the specialist referral is a revenue center, you can't control it. If it's a cost center, you can. So thinking about how to get care coordination as a way of modifying the cost centers is the secret to that, in my mind, the secret to turning that screw. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to let Dr. Bolin have the last word. <laughs> last comment Oops. has to do with GINA, um, and GINA specifically permits the military to discriminate against people with germline mutations and to prevent them from entering the military. So, so much for the VA. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, thank you to all of our speakers today. Thanks to the audience and the people on the phone, and we'll reconvene uh, shortly.